the antidote. 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 You're listening to the antidote with a walking with Christian music that doesn't suck.
The antidote rarely gets into discussing a film, as we typically want to look at music generated by Christians. But when a documentary comes out that shares the story of extreme metal created by Christians, it's worthwhile finding out more. The Metal Missionaries documentary goes for an in-depth look into the hearts and minds of extreme Christian metal musicians, from big-name artists to unsigned bands, but both sharing the same message of Christ's love. With artists like Ahilda Diapon, with the song Darkness That Can Be Felt, it's a gloomy song, but it serves a purpose. And most of the music on tonight's episode come from artists who shared their thoughts in the film. Regular listeners to The Antidote already know what to expect, but some Christians still take issue with the fact that death metal, black metal, and just metal in general can be delivered within a Christian context. Two people who know that metal does serve a purpose are the film creators, Bruce Moore and Colin Jones, as we found out when they came to The Antidote for a talk about Metal Missionaries, the documentary. The Antidote is joined by Bruce Moore and Colin Jones, both involved with the new documentary, Metal Missionaries. Guys, great to have you here. Hey, thanks for having us, man. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Well, Bruce, I have to aim this at you. Is it true that you're actually the filmmaker Michael Moore in disguise? <laughs> I wish I had his money, but no, I'm not. I'm not that Michael Moore in disguise, that's for sure. Uh, but I guess both of you do create documentaries. Okay, so we won't be expecting the sequel to Roger and Me. But seriously, though, what about giving us a quick overview of Metal Missionaries? All right, so I grew up in the church and grew up listening to metal, and there was always sort of this weird, uh, I guess, conflict because you know metal always, in, especially in the early eight stages, metal was always like rebellion and that sort of thing. It was always hard to find stuff that agreed or jived with my upbringing. And so, uh, you know, found Striper, found bands like Trouble and Striper and kind of dug that whole thing. And over the years, you know, I'm still a metalhead. I still write for a bunch of magazines. And um, I found this movement that's pretty amazing. I mean, there's a bunch of musicians in these really dark black metal areas or extreme metal areas that are really, you know, preaching the gospel and doing that sort of thing. And it sort of intrigued me. And so when we decided to put this thing together, Colin and I decided to take it from a... When you see the film, you'll see that it has, you know, a certain outcome. But we kind of tried to take a neutral side because we have bands from both sides of the coin, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's dozens of metal subgenres. So how do you define extreme metal? Well, I guess if I'm defining extreme metal, I'm, I'm thinking more death, thrash, and black metal. I know there's a million of those subgenres like metalcore and deathcore, and I, I don't even know anymore. It's probably <laughs> nurse or something else out there. But I mean, I, I think I'm an old school guy, probably dating myself, but I kind of stick to the more traditional metal genres. Here's a great example of the music Bruce and Colin are speaking about the black metal of Frost Like Ashes with a cruel verse. Yeah! 
mention about some of the other people involved in the film and that's where I was sort of surprised to find that you also had interviews with non-Christian bands like Necronomicon and Goat Horror. Yeah. Why look for their input? I think I wanted to get input from all sides of the spectrum. I think you'll see as you watch it that it's not what you think. Most of these bands are not saying you know, we're totally against it. I still think the metal community is a metal community, whether you're Christian or non-Christian. And I think that's something that may surprise people towards the end where, you know, even bands like Samael and, and like you mentioned, Goat Whore, totally opposite side of the spectrum of the title of the film. Even though they're not really interested in it, they don't trash it. But I wasn't really finding that from the film. I was finding that they weren't being very supportive of the idea of Christian metal artists, period. I mean, a couple of the bands said that they thought Christians have no place in black metal. Yeah, it definitely opens up with Necronomicon doing that, and you're right. But I think I wanted to cover all sides of the spectrum, and I think when we got into it, I didn't really know where it was going to go. We kind of started brainstorming the idea, I guess, and I wanted opinions from all sides. I think opening, especially with opening with that statement and then closing the way it closes, kind of comes full circle. There's quite a history of black metal artists really disliking, maybe that's too light of a word, let's better say that they hate Christian artists coming into the genre. I remember how in the 90s, one black metal band threatened to kill the members of the Christian band in Testor, and that wasn't an idle threat. They actually did intend to kill them. How much has changed since then? From from my point of view and from the interviews that I've done and obviously, I didn't get to everybody in some of those Norwegians, although I did get Norgeville in there, who was one of the original or traditional Norwegian black metal band. They disagree with it totally, don't think it has any reason to be there, but they still, at the same time, think it can coexist. One positive comment I found in the film did come from Goat Horror. He'd said that he wants to see artists portray their music intelligently like Demon Hunter, who obviously doesn't fit into the extreme metal realm. He wants artists to back up their strong views, otherwise it's invalid. So what do you guys think? Are Christian artists backing up their views? Well, first of all, I'm going to let Colin take over in a second, but I want to tell you that's my favorite line in the whole freaking movie. That was absolutely great. Ben nailed it. Because that's totally the way I feel. I mean, I think if you're going to be in it, you're in it. and It can't be a gimmick. Although I think not only will people see through it, but it also makes things incredibly cheesy. And I think the especially the Christian metal scene, has suffered greatly over the years by putting out cheesy crap just to get it out there and say Hosanna or or the name of Jesus or whatever with no substance behind it and no belief or whatever behind it. There's so much Christian people push crap out that for years they've just been pushing out junk. Let me throw Hosanna on it in three chords and call it you know metal and it's just garbage. And I don't understand how people can miss the whole art form. I think, you know, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you have to throw the art form and the creativity out and just be ridiculous. That's what it's been for so many years, it feels like. 
it has been that way for so many years. So I think he's 100 percent right when he said, you know, if you're really going to do this, it's got to be done correctly and for the right reason. And then it, you know, it makes it quite valid. So you, you both have the same view on that. I'm totally with Ben. I, when I heard that line when I was recording, I went, holy crap, that's the whole movie in a nutshell.
credited for starting the Northern European Christian black metal scene in 1990, and Testor gave us the return. A number of Christian metal bands over the years that have found a lot of success. More in the mainstream, and certainly not in the evangelical style. You know, people like August Burns Red. Yes, yeah, definitely. Well, you know, at times I have to wonder if you're fighting windmills with this film. I mean, I'm not sure that this still holds true, but Christians have been notorious about condemning all styles of metal. So where does the support for these artists come from? Well, that's a good question. I think there's a there's definitely a hardcore underground scene, for sure. It built in a lot of these churches, and, and especially now with the internet, you can just Google it anywhere you want, and Christian metal underground and all that kind of stuff. That's probably where they're getting most of their... I assume we're talking about not August Burns Red, right? We're talking about the people in the film? Yeah, the people in the film. Yeah, so they're, most of that stuff is really underground. I mean, most of the support is coming from you know the kids, but they're getting it through the internet and that sort of thing. Was it tough choosing which Christian metal artist that you wanted to interview for the film? I wouldn't necessarily say it was tough. I definitely think that as we sifted through things, you, you kind of want the ones that are, like you said, that are validating what they're claiming. Uh, that's definitely something I think as Christians, period, have to deal with. When you put yourself with such stark views and such strong beliefs, you're automatically throwing yourself on a pedestal. And then to become an artist, especially a Christian artist, um, in a metal scene where you don't see it as frequently, it's spotlights you know, shining on you a million times brighter waiting for your next mistake. Um, and when it came to choosing the artist, you know, you want to find someone that's genuine and that, like we had just, you had just discussed, really, really believes what they're singing about. Well, what you just spoke about comes up. During the film commentary, it was said that too high a standard is placed on Christian artists. Should not all of us be held to this standard? So pressure is put on them to be perfect but they're just faulty people like the rest of us. So how do these artists handle that? I'm going to say, honestly, that's almost something that you'd have to ask one of the artists. Um, I mean, I know that it's just as your average uh, Christian, you know, I know that I'm going to make mistakes and I'm not perfect. Um, How I can't honestly imagine how I'd react if I knew that thousands and thousands of people that look at me as a you know an idol or their fans uh, would react to something like that. That's one of those ones that's a little beyond me, honestly, at this point. You have to introduce us to uh, the new person that's coming to the conversation. What's your bird's name? Oh no, you can hear that. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, yeah, we're sitting on my front porch, and this stupid bird just kind of landed about ten feet from us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay, so maybe a songbird does have a sweeter tone than the vocals on Crush the Head of the Serpent from Bloodthirsty, but enjoy it anyway. Crush the Head of the Serpent!
Okay, so what about these Christian extreme metal artists? Are they having success in the marketplace? Well, I guess we got to figure out how we're going to define success. If we're discussing monetary success, probably not. I mean, most of the, most of the people I've talked to, most of the people I know through doing you know my many years in the business, have some sort of other job or some sort of thing they do on the side, whether it's freelancing or whatever to get through. But if you're determining success based on are they reaching people, which is their goal anyway, then I would probably say yes, it's successful. So then the message then itself is actually of a more importance than the finances. Yeah, and I think I think that's a hundred percent true, and I think you'll find that and if you ask any of the bands, you know, involved in, I think they'd probably all say the same thing, yeah. Let's face it, the music business died years ago and this is sort of like a labor of love for even non Christian bands. And you know, like I said, I work with bands all the time and these guys are out there driving in vans, humping it, you know, forty, fifty years old, still doing the thing, not because they're making a lot of money, but because they just, you know, love what they do and and they're getting their music out there. So I think from the Christian side of it, yeah, they're getting their message out there and doing their thing, but definitely not because they're riding around in limousines or even tour buses for that matter. I just thought maybe they were just enjoying sleeping in their car in Walmart parking lots. <laughs> <laughs> you know about the Walmart parking lots, huh? Been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> really, these artists are feeling driven through faith to give the message that they're giving. Definitely agree with you when you say that. Um, it's something not only with the musician's experience. I feel like just growing up in uh, the church, that's something that you're taught from a very young age. Is it's by faith. So they're just exemplifying that with the way that they continue to persevere. Whether it's you know any kind of hardship they're going to face on the road or any kind of pushback when they're trying to give their message. I wonder with these artists having such an evangelical message how much difficulty they might have in actually finding a venue or a proper atmosphere to play in? I mean, that's a tough question because I think nowadays, pretty much, as you said, you know, August Burns Red and some of these bands have kind of, I don't know, blazing the path because even Striper, you know, plays out to regular crowds and they don't have too much trouble. And just by, you know, going to shows here in Richmond, shows come through town, they get it. They get out there. I don't know what the, you know, attendance is. I guess it really depends on the, you know, the day of the week and, you know, what the weather is and how much it's promoted. But I don't think as far as like club owners go or, or that sort of thing, I don't even think that makes a difference anymore. I think it's just, you know, they book the bands who they think to put the people in the, in the venue. And if it's good music, people are going to show up. And do you consider all of these Christian extreme metal bands to be equal to their counterparts in the mainstream? I'm going to say it depends on one's tastes. Uh, I know many people who love that kind of stuff, and they are hardcore about it, and they are willing to go. And it may be a fewer number of people versus um, what some of these death metal bands and, and just more mainstream um, non-Christian brands are going to bring in. I've seen people travel pretty long distances to go see a particular band. Local listeners of The Antidote will be interested to know that Sam John, the lead vocalist of White Noise, is away from his home in India and is in Toronto helping to build a metal church, which opens late this October. Here's their song, God Mode.
spoke a little bit earlier about bands feeling driven to give their message. Have you felt that equally for the two of you to be able to put out this film, Metal Missionaries? For me, myself, I would say, yeah. I mean, this was a uh, something I thought about for a long time and have wanted to do. I mean, a really long time. This was years in the making in my head and, you know, trying to figure out exactly how to do it. And it totally was equating myself to a band at this point. It totally was a labor of love. I mean, there was no financial support involved. It was kind of, you know, all out of out of pocket and pretty much a real DIY sort of thing, sort of like these guys are, you know, doing out on the road. It's all DIY stuff to get the message out because I totally believe in the in, in what they're doing. And don't get me wrong, I'm a metalhead and I love all that stuff, but I definitely think there is a place for the more positive, more spiritual kind of stuff as well. Then who would you say that Metal Missionaries is aimed towards? Will non-Christians want to see it also? Um, Because I've actually sat and thought about that. I guess when I originally put it together, it was more geared towards the, I think in the back of my head, I was gearing it towards the Christian market. And more to, I think the original thought was more to sort of validate the whole scene. But then it became something totally different. And I think, as you'll see, I mean, you've seen it, so I think as you'll see, there's definitely input from lots of non-Christian bands, and I think it will appeal to everyone. And maybe even, you know, shed some light on some of these bands, and they're not just, you know, a bunch of fools singing Hosanna. They're actually great musicians who happen to have a faith system.
There is a less common metal style, the ambient black metal of Vials of Wrath, with Revival of the Embers, an artist whose music I've long enjoyed, helped with the soundtrack of Metal Missionaries. Here's the story. I noticed during the credits that you had Clank doing the soundtrack, and I've been a big fan for a long time, as they were doing the industrial metal. How did you do that connection? Well, honestly, me and Clank have been buddies from New York since probably early middle school. We went to youth groups together out on Long Island and grew up together in and out of the church and have kept in touch all these years. And um, he actually did the soundtrack or the intro theme song for my other project, Brutally Delicious. So when it came time to do this, especially if you keep up with Clank, he's sort of back into the, the faith fold again. Um, when it came time to put this together, I was sent him a text and said, hey, do you know anybody who'd be interested in doing it? And he kind of laughed and said, uh, me. <laughs> and then him, Pat and Eric took it to task and we sent them, you know, a, a screener and they just scored it. And he's also been recording again. New album out, isn't there? Yeah, they're working on a couple different things. New album's out. They've got a new synth lullaby project, I think, coming out. And I talked to him today and they're going to release the soundtrack to this movie separately as well on their site.
well, I guess we really need the most important details. So where and when can we get to see metal missionaries? We are releasing September 15th. So we're talking less than 10 days before it'll go live. And as of now, we've got the digital release. We are still currently working to get um, DVD and Blu-ray. So as of the 15th, if you go to Real House, that's R-E-E-L-H-O-U-S-E, media, we're going to release it there via digital download, MP4 format or whatever format you need. But they're also going to have the, uh, the rental for 48 hours. So you have two different prices. You can buy it to download or you can rent it for two days. And then eventually, like Colin just said, we're working on distribution for DVD and Blu-ray. Then the two of you are going to be busy touring this through the Documentary Film Festival Network. Yes, we are. Um, glad you brought that up. Uh, September 30th is our first one. It's a Christian film festival in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, we are currently waiting to hear back from four or five more. One, Another one in Virginia. We've got a film festival in Bulgaria, Australia, Scotland, and an online film festival in Hong Kong. And after doing a lot of talking, we've decided we're going to go ahead and enter into Sundance and see what happens. Cool. Great that you've been getting that much interest about the film. It's I've, been overwhelming. Yeah, I was amazed, actually. It's, it's really interesting to put it out there to people. Like, we've been working on this forever, it seems like. And, you know, you let people in your circle see it and everybody tells you, yeah, yeah, it's great. And they blow smoke up your your bunghole or whatever, but it's really nice when you submit it to a festival and people don't know you or these reviewers and they actually get it. That's something I'd like to hear about. When did you actually first start the film? How long's the process been? I'm saying at least two years from, well, the, like I said earlier, the idea has been in my head for a long, long time, but I think actual putting, you know, the uh, pen to paper sort of thing is probably two years. Yeah. Two years. Uh, Bruce and I, former co-workers, it's kind of funny how it started. Uh, he heard that I like to write. Uh, I've always wanted to be a writer, never really been successful at it, just do it for fun. And he one day said, I heard you write. Would you write something for me? And I thought it was kind of a joke, so I went ahead and said, yeah, I'll make a man happy. And what was it, maybe 45 minutes I had you the intro? And I don't think we changed the intro that much. And, I mean, it just became a passion project for me at that point. Well, Colin, Bruce, thanks so much for coming to The Antidote. It's been really interesting to hear about Metal Missionaries. Awesome. Thank you, awesome. sir. I appreciate your time. Appreciate it. Metal Missionaries is a film well worth seeing. As Colin, Bruce, and I spoke about during our talk, a large number of Christians don't understand the role of Christian metal. This documentary explains it. The Antidote is having a celebration next week as this program begins its seventh year of broadcasting, and I really can't believe it's been that long. I'm going to bring a wide cross-section of artists who fit the definition of The Antidote's tagline, Christian music that doesn't suck. And here's another definition for you. To exhort means communicating emphatically, urging someone to do something. That point couldn't be better said than on the track, Ashlyn Messiah from Exhortation. See you next week. Thank you.